Thank you, Rosie, and good evening, everybody. I'd like to start with a few lines from Sylvia Plath, who famously said that dying is an art like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. When she wrote those lines, she was drawing specifically on her own experience of attempting and only narrowly avoiding suicide several times. But she could equally be, have been describing what probably all of us deep down might fear will one day be our fate, that death, the, the act of dying is destined for all of us to be this uniquely horrible, dreadful experience, something to recoil from and, and try to shrink from at all costs. As an NHS palliative care doctor, I've chosen to do the opposite. I made a very deliberate conscious decision a few years ago to specialize in this daunting business of human exploration, right up close and personal. And many people are surprised when I, I, I tell them that's what I've chosen to do. The, the obvious question being, if you're a doctor, if you have just been through all those years of training, so now you have the skills to do extraordinary things, you can cure cancers, restart stopped hearts, uh, transplant faces, all these incredible things, why would you specialize in death and dying? Why immerse yourself in something that has the unmistakable, unmistakable uh, taint, for want of a better word, of medical failure? Because if your patient dies, surely you haven't achieved anything as a doctor. I think it's a good question, and uh, there's undoubtedly a hierarchy in the medical professions. If neurosurgeons are the rock stars right there at the top with all the power and status and glamour, then we in palliative medicine are definitely the dowdy support act. We're pretty low rank, we're semi-invisible, we lurk in the corners, and, and even often other doctors aren't entirely sure what we get up to. The, the public, typically when someone finds out what I, I do for a living, they'll maybe flinch a little bit, look a bit uneasy and apprehensive, and say something like, gosh, I don't know how you can do that, it must be so depressing. And, and I don't blame them, because one day I used to think that too in the past. As for patients, when a patient is uh, faced with the prospect of entering a hospice for the very first time, they are often consumed with fear, dread even, and they think that when they cross the threshold, that's it. The only thing that will be left for them to experience now is dying. There's no other possibility of a, a positive kind of experience in their life. Um, so, so there is an awful lot of taboo around this subject, and this is partly why I wanted to, to write my second book, Dear Life, to, to try and dispel some of this. Half a million people die in Britain every year. Uh, and so it's a common phenomenon, and yet very few of us are willing to consider, let alone talk, discuss openly what it may be like at the end of our lives. And to some extent, this is because in 21st century Britain, death, like birth, has really been outsourced to paid professionals. Once upon a time, not even 100 years ago, the majority of births and deaths took place in the family home with family members present. And so there was a much more intimate awareness of both those processes. Now, however, the start and end of our lives have both been largely institutionalized. The majority of people in Britain 
will die in a hospital, and the second most common place where people will die is a care home. It's not in, in people's homes at all. So it's perfectly possible in 2020 to live an entire lifetime never seeing somebody actually die. And, and therefore, it may surprise you to learn that for me, working as I do every day in my NHS hospice, it's really not the proximity to death that strikes me most fundamentally. It's actually the abundance of life. And by life, I mean all of the things that we know deep down really matter. Sophie just summarized them at the end. Things like love and kindness and compassion and strength and courage. All of those things are there in a hospice at people's bedsides, only more so than anywhere else. More powerful and more concentrated and more vivid because, of course, nothing concentrates the mind quite like time running out. I thought it would be valuable to try and explain why I feel like this, why I find my hospice such an uplifting and actually life-affirming place to live. To live? That's a Freudian slip, work even. Uh, <laughs> and there's no better way to do that than with... John. So, so this is a gentleman called John Carberry, and I'm sharing his image and his story with his permission. John was like no other 93-year-old I've ever met, despite being 93 and despite having a tracheostomy, which you can see there, that little plastic tube in his neck. That is a tube uh, that enables him to breathe because he had a cancer at the base of his tongue and it occluded, it blocked his airway. Despite all of that, John insisted on cycling to his oncology appointments up and down Oxford's hills without fail, rain or shine. And in fact, one day, the wind was so strong it actually blew him off his bike, leading his oncologist to write in the notes afterwards that John was clearly made of stern stuff because, and I quote, he simply brushed himself off and carried on. So that's the kind of man he was. I met him for the first time the morning after he arrived in the hospice where I work. And he had had a pretty torrid night. He had spent most of the night bleeding very um, tor torrentially, really, from that tumour. And nobody expected him to survive the night. So when I went to meet him for the first time, I thought I would be meeting someone very unwell indeed, maybe even unconscious. I was pretty surprised, therefore, when I opened the door to his room to find a man sitting bolt upright in bed, looking not only animated, but also immensely displeased. Uh, he couldn't speak at that time, but he was gesticulating wildly and demanding pen and paper. He had something imperative that he wanted to communicate to his doctor. Well, I thought, this maybe something very profound. Maybe he wants to write a last message to his loved ones, his family, something precious, full of meaning. I looked down at his very spidery, scrawly, rather doctorly handwriting, and when I deciphered it, I realized that what he'd actually written, in capitals for emphasis, much like the US president on Twitter, was the sentence, where the hell is my whiskey? <laughs> and when he had arrived in our hospice, which has an extremely well-stocked drinks trolley, John had been promised uh, an evening drink just before he spent most of the night very, very nearly bleeding to death. And he hadn't received it, and he was absolutely disgusted by this. He thought it was appalling. <laughs> There are major trust issues. So I, we, we sorted out an urgent whiskey and then in subsequent conversations uh, discovered that actually gin, uh, uh, John's drink of choice was pink gin and lemonade. And this 
is his actual pink gin glass in the hospice. So every day with his lunch, he would have a pink gin and lemonade. And sometimes when he, he drank his gin, he and I would have a conversation about his philosophy of life, which could be summed up in two words. He would sit there and he would say, transmit love. Nothing else matters, Rachel transmit love and in fact that is exactly what he did in the hospice he knew every single person's names even I'm ashamed to admit the names of one or two of the cleaning staff that I had never introduced myself to and everybody without fail loved him and I tell his story because it seems to capture something which many people may not imagine about a hospice, which is that for all patients' proximity to the end of their life, until you die, you are very much alive. And the absolute founding principle of palliative medicine is that our job is to enable our patients to live on their own terms. No one else is definitely not their doctor's on their own terms as fully and richly as they possibly can for what remains of their lives, however short that period of time may be. So just to give you an idea of that, I work in a hospice called Catherine House Hospice in North Oxfordshire. And it's, uh, it's, it's leafy, it's full of light, it has huge windows, there are gorgeous gardens and oak trees outside, incredible birds, we have lots of bird feeders and we also have sparrow hawks that come in and slaughter the birds every so often, which I always think is slightly has the potential for alarm, but the patients seem to cope with it. Um, and we try very, very hard through tiny little acts to do just what John said, to transmit love, whether that's through a pink gin or a homemade smoothie or a date night that we organize for a patient and their spouse, or even most recently, a full-size cardboard cutout of Daniel Craig, who... <laughs> <laughs> recently appeared in one of my female patients' rooms. <laughs> I needed to visit very often. Uh, so all kinds of things go on. And uh, this is about trying to enable people to live at the end of their lives. I'm not the kind of doctor who would ever try to sugarcoat reality and I'm not going to stand here and say that dying is effortless and easy and can be wholly and fully without pain. Although these days we are very, very good at controlling physical symptoms and if you get the right care, with big emphasis on the word if, then it's really incredibly unusual for me to care for somebody who really suffers with pain or other symptoms at the end of their life. We, we, we've got excellent drugs and techniques now to control those. But of course, there is one particular aspect of the end of life which no amount of morphine or any other drug can uh, palliate, and that is the pain of knowing that every single thing and every single one person that you love in the world is slipping through your grasp. That is the terrible price we all pay for being living creatures who are mortal and who are destined from the moment we take our first breath to die one day. For this, this anguish of being mortal. It's my very strong belief as a palliative care doctor that my patient John is entirely right. What really matters in a hospice is human connection. It is the care and the love that we transmit to each other, whether that is doctor to patient, loved one to patient, 
nursing assistant to patient, these little webs and networks of love and reaching out with kindness and care to each other are everything. They are the vital medicine and it's other people that make the difference. Just to highlight how important that is, I'm going to share a, a slide with you um, that relates to a story from last year that went viral for very understandable reasons and also skirt a slide I forgot to click on. So this, this story relates to a 78-year-old gentleman called Ernest Quintana, an American who, who died of a chronic lung disease last year in a Californian hospital. Um, but the person, in inverted commas, who told him that there was no longer anything to do, uh, that all that could happen now was his medical team needed to palliate him and that he was going to die in the next day or so was not a person at all. It, it was this, and this is a photo taken by Mr. Quintana's granddaughter from his hospital room. This is something known as tele-rounding, and it's a response to the shortage of doctors in, in many um, countries developed or otherwise. This, this solution is for a robot to be wheeled into a patient's room so that a doctor who is who knows how many hundred miles away can interact with the patient. So this gentleman was told he was going to die by an image on a computer screen, which is pretty grotesque, I would suggest. And I share this because I think it underlines just how important the alternative is. If there is any metric that defines how civilized we are as a society, then surely it is the care and attention and kindness with which we look after each other as we reach the ends of our lives. Who could be more important than that in, in society and who is in greater need of resources and care? And I will leave you with just one thought. Most people, m most of you probably assume that palliative care is an integral core part of the NHS. Of course it should be, um, but it's not. My hospice is only 25% funded by the government, by the NHS, and we have to raise the other three and a half million pounds a year from our local community who are extraordinarily generous in donating the money that enables us to treat patients who are dying with difficult symptoms in my local community. But there's no other part of the NHS that relies on how much money the jumble sale raised last Saturday to deliver its care. And to me, it seems terribly, terribly wrong that palliative medicine and hospice care is so extraordinarily poorly funded by the government. Yes, people are generous, inordinately generous, but this should be a core part of what we as a society through our taxes provide for each other. So I will end with just one final thought. If you think this matters, and if you think providing the very best, highest standards of care to people at the end of life is important, then heed Sophie's five principles of rebellion and act, because this is an easy thing to change in society. I'm pretty relentless about it, both publicly and in private, and I will continue to harangue every possible person with power, whether this is... I'm trying to get to Boris Johnson. I've already got to the former health secretary, and I'm also aiming for the current one. It needs to change, and we can all act to try and change that. If you tweet once about it, if you write to your MP, if you write a letter to your newspaper, if you stamp your feet and say, why are we not funding end-of-life care as a society because we're certainly rich enough and civilised enough to do that, then we could change this. And hopefully more people like John can enjoy an end of life which is filled with meaning. Thank you very much.